Hey viewers, welcome back to my channel, Vaha Woman. This is your friend, Us Rajni Vohra, and I'm absolutely thrilled to introduce my today's guest, who is a multi-award billing filmmaker, producer, director, and a human rights campaigner. Her production includes films like East is East, Mrs. Red Cliff, Cliff Revolution, West is West, and the documentary India's Daughter, which sparked a global movement uh, that to end violence against women and led her to found a UK and US based non profitable initiative, Think Equal. Guys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together to welcome this strong, spirited, and creative lady, Leslie Odwin. Thank you so much. That's really, really kind. What a beautiful introduction. I thank you for that. Humbly so. Thank you so much, Leslie. We welcome you wholeheartedly on our show. And we feel really privileged to have you on our show today. So thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. My great pleasure. So Leslie, I would definitely love to understand one thing from you, looking at your achievements in your life as you won numerous titles, very prestigious awards, you know, immense recognition, fame during your lifetime. And when you look at your all achievements, how do you feel? Do you feel more contented or you feel more geared up with your goals? It's a great question, Rajni. And I think the absolute truth is that I've made choices in my later life at the age of 57, I fundamentally changed course in my life and moved away from being a filmmaker, which was all of my life and existence and everything I loved and understood and looked forward to. And I abandoned it completely in favor of actually activating and engendering much needed and urgent change in the world. And since that happened to me, I have completely reappraised and rethought all of my values. Yeah. And one of the extraordinary things that has happened is that I have freed myself of all of those selfish trappings of the personality yes. that was me. Right. And for me now, there is absolutely no importance in money as long as I can eat and have a roof over my head. There is absolutely no importance in recognition and fame. They are hollow. Yes. I have awards on my mantle shelf. I've actually started giving awards away. So there was a film that I made, in fact, you know, India's Daughter. Yeah. I gave the award that I won to my partner in Denmark, who yeah. had worked a little bit on the film, not a great deal. <laughs> right. But I gave the, because it's actually meaningless. Yes. All that matters is what you leave behind you. Mm. Nothing else matters. So in terms of, you know, all of these achievements and, and some of it is just so kind of ridiculous. You know, the New York Times says, you are the second most impactful woman after Hillary Clinton in this year, 2006. What does that mean, actually? Mm -hmm. Whose opinion is that? What one person thinks that, uh, the editor of a magazine? Of a, what, what does it mean? We yes. have, as a world, we are much too focused on mm -hmm. one minute of fame, mm -hmm. uh, instant, you know, uh, every child wants to be a pop star or an actor. For what purpose? Not to communicate goodness, mm -hmm. not to commune with human beings, which is actually the true purpose of right. those professions, yes. but to become famous, well, it's stupid, it's misguided, it's idiotic. And quite frankly, it is hollow. Right. So everything that has happened to me so far in terms of these awards and recognitions have done exactly what you so eloquently uh, put into your question. It has made me understand that my work has only just begun. And actually, the true and only recognition I want is from my family and friends when I am buried, which sadly is, you know, I'm closer to in my life than the other end, right? Uh -oh. But when I am buried, 
Yeah. I want my children in particular, my two children, who to me represent the world in the future. Yes. I want my two children to say, my mother left something valuable behind. Yes. She changed what she could. She yes. made the world a better place for us and those who came after us and for our children. That's the only meaning of existence. I don't believe in God. Uh -huh. I'm totally irreligious. Okay. For me, the only religion and anything sacred is people-oriented. We need to reverse the trends of this horrible, selfish indifference, this destructive, sad to say, male-led, and I don't say that controversially, but it is true. Yes. That where we see women leading, we see positive nurturing, mm -hmm. not to an acceptable enough degree, because women are also programmed. There is yes. no question, right. you know. But certainly women are programmed to nurture. Women are not programmed to make crass, vile, and evil decisions like men make on a daily basis about wars, yeah. about following business to the degree of exclusion of humanity, yes. of continuing to ruin our planet because of big business interests because of a kind of sense of patriarchal aggression uh, that they feel gives them the right to go in and plan the destruction of whole peoples and families. One of the worst images and most resonant images that I will never forget as long as I live happened during this pandemic when the maternity hospital in Afghanistan was bombed. Mm -hmm. And we saw this image of a soldier mm. in full uniform, a man holding a tiny newborn baby in his left hand and a gun in the other. And to me, that said it all. Mm. That is the state that manhood has reached. And we have to resist and stop that because the world is too precious a place for us to continue to allow those programmed men of former years to be running it. It's not acceptable anymore. It's over. True, true, true. So Leslie, I just want to move this conversation towards a serious topic, uh, which shook the entire world. And after seven years, three months, Nirbhya got justice. How do you look at it after seven years, three months? She did not get justice. Justice has not been meted out. There will only be justice for Nirbhaya. There will only be justice for her when we start to teach our children to love, not hate. When we start to teach our male children yes. that girls are of absolute equal value to them and that a girl who goes out to a 6.30 screening of Life of Pi at Sackett Mall Yes. and comes out at 20 to 9, despite the fact that it's dark, who is there with her friend, who is, no, not her husband, no, not her brother, hmm. a friend. And whether it's her boyfriend or friend is none of anybody's business. Yes. But the fact that those rapists were programmed to look at her and say, you're out at, uh, on the streets after dark, means you're a bad girl. Mm -hmm. You're with a boy who isn't your husband or your brother. You're a slut. Hmm. If you're giving him some, give us some. That is literally how they saw this. Yes. And that entitled them. They told me, I sat in front of them for yes. 31 hours in total, sitting with rapists and yes. murderers in Tihar jail. I looked in their eyes and I can tell you, the truth is they genuinely didn't believe they'd done wrong. Can you imagine that the rapists and murderers of Nirbaya who everybody knows every detail about what happened in that case. Can you imagine that they say not only was it her fault, but we had a duty to teach her a lesson. Who has done that to these boys? Who has taught them this? We have taught them this. We have to take responsibility and culpability. Those boys didn't pick that sociocultural thought out of the air. 
And they are exactly the same as the boys in UK, Canada, US, Australia, everywhere else in the world. Yes. Whom we teach. Yes. There is a difference. You yeah. can ascribe lesser value to this sort of girl. Yeah. A girl who drinks is, is a loose girl. A girl who this, a girl who that. Different rules apply to girls. Why? Because yeah. patriarchy has decreed it. Right. That actually gives them license sure. to treat them differently, to see them as sexual objects. Right. We are responsible for this. And until we stand up and take responsibility and say, as much as we created it, yes. we can also dismantle it systemically. Yes. And it's not just about gender, it's yes. about caste. Yes. It's about race. Yes. I mean, the caste system is absolutely identical to the apartheid system as was in South Africa. You tell me what the difference is between those two systems. How come the caste system can carry on unabated? And you know, you'll tell me, well, there are laws, or not you, but people will say, well, there are laws to... Yes. Laws are as nothing in the face of culture. Yes. Culture trumps laws. You tell me about dowry. The laws about dowry are, dowry is illegal. Anyone who gives or takes dowry should be put in prison because it's illegal. Yes. You tell me, are Indian families not taking or giving dowries? Of course not. <laughs> of course they are. Because it's the culture, despite the law. And are the police coming into those families and taking them into prison because they're breaking the law? Of course not. So what does the dowry law mean? Nothing. It means nothing. Because there's no will to enforce it. It's about reassuring everyone, oh yeah, we don't agree with dowry debts. Try not to burn your wife at the tandoor, you know, just because you want another car, another television. It's illegal. Yes. I mean, this is just such hypocrisy. We're responsible and we can dismantle. We should be actually, we should be. And so, I mean, my next question was actually related to when gender equality begins at home, you know, and families are at the front line to take charge of it. That's a real problem, my friend. <laughs> And I, I don't know, but uh, Leslie, I, at least in India, I feel mothers can play very important roles to teach their sons to respect women. Because first of all, they should be respecting themselves. Then only probably they can teach their sons, you know, to respect other women who comes in their life. I think that is very important. Rajni, I agree with you completely. And I would say that is very logical and there's a big case to be made for that. But there is a major flaw in that argument and a major problem with it. If you look at the science as I have, right? Because after that film, India's Daughter, I understood very, very clearly that the disease we are dealing with here is not the violence, that's the symptom of the disease. The disease is the mindset of gender inequality in that particular instance, right? Right. If the disease is mindset, hmm. how do we change mindset? We can only change mindset through education. education. The lawyer of, you know, three of the, uh, of, of the rapists, how can he say, if my daughter behaved like Nirbhaya did, her crime being going to see a movie at 6.30 that came out at 20 to 9 and being with a boy on a bus who was not her husband or her brother. If my daughter did what she did, he said, I would take her to my farmhouse and in front of my family, I would pour petrol on her and burn her alive. This is a lawyer, a so-called educated lawyer. What does that mean? It means the education he's had is worth less. It's worthless. It's not fit for purpose. You can send your children to universities to learn whatever it is you want them to learn, law, engineering, whatever it is. You can force them to work at these academics and numeracy and literacy and they go out and rape or commit suicide because they're depressed. What's the point in any of that? 
when you're not teaching them values, you're not teaching them a moral compass, you're not teaching them how to control their emotions, you're not teaching them anything that matters to live a life that is valuable and worthwhile, what is the point? So in this research, when I understood that it's not just access to education, and it's certainly not access to the kind of education those lawyers had, I started a major research program for myself to find out about child development. At what point does a child develop moral consciousness? Yes. It's at three. Mm -hmm. At what point does the, you know, and what I discovered from the science, from the neuroscience, and this isn't an opinion I'm about to tell you, it is a fact. Yes. By the age of six, in certain respects, emotional control, habitual ways of responding, the activity flatlines. You are at six in those respects what you are at 66 or 86, unless you've gone through many years of therapy to undo the bad wiring. Why would you do that? It costs a lot to go to therapy and takes a lot of time. And a lot of damage can be done before you've reached the point of having been therapized, as it were, if there was such a word, right? Why would you do that instead of just build it right in the first place when you can make the difference to the hard wiring for the rest of that child's life? And by the age of five, 90% of the adult brain is fully formed by the age of five. Now, those parents who you say, and I'm sorry, this is such a circuitous answer to your question, no, no, not an issue, absolutely. Yeah, please. Those parents who you say, rightly, we should be able to rely on parents who have the charge of their children for the early years in life when the difference is really being made, they should be able to take care of this moral compass of their children. But by definition, those parents are above the age of six. And those parents already have hard wiring that is discriminating, that is full of lack of self-worth. That is, we have mothers who allow their husbands to beat them, even in front of the children, who allow their husbands to rape them in marital rape, even, right? Yes, yes. Who, who look at their boys and say, come on, eat, eat better, you know. <laughs> You, you need to be strong. You have more milk, more milk. You give him half, give him half your glass because you don't need as much milk. You're a girl. You know, we are programmed already. So how in God's name are we suddenly as parents at home going to turn into those embracing, enabling, empowering teachers? We can't do it and we can't expect the parents to do it. So we need the teachers to do it in the classrooms mm -hmm. and we need them to do it according to instructions and a prescription because those teachers are also already set in stone right right we need to tackle it differently but the children need to get it because every year five-year-olds are escaping into the six-year-old bracket where in certain respects, it's too late. Now, I'm not giving up on anyone above the age of six. People get annoyed with me or irritated sometimes and say, you can't just, you know, I'm not giving up on them. I'm just saying, you deal with them. I'm dealing with the foundation because hardly anybody else is. You tell me what programs there are that are comprehensive, that are repetitive, that are as serious as numeracy and literacy, which is what this charity uh, I've developed does, right? Yes. We've created materials. We've created, you know, books and uh, 74 books wow. about all of the themes, 25 competencies and skills that are required, mm -hmm. inclusion, gender equality. We're teaching our children gender equality from level one to level three for three years. You know, we are saying if you deem it to be compulsory for there to be literacy and numeracy for children in school while they're developing. How can you say it's not compulsory for the children to learn how to value another human being? And it's not compulsory for them to learn how to lead healthy relationships. 
or control their anger or their fear or their stress. Stress in early childhood, it is a proven neuroscientific and medical fact. Stress in early childhood is as huge a predictor of cardiovascular disease in adult life as any other predictor of cardiovascular disease. So even just on a pure physical health basis, we've got to deal with this. We've lost our way. We've lost our way in education. We have failed to reimagine it. We are still using a system that is more than 200 years old from the Industrial Revolution, whose purpose was to fill factories, and it's simply not any longer fit for purpose. And if we don't wake up out of our deep sleep that we've been sleepwalking through for all this time, we know what's going to happen more of what is already happening, more wars, more refugees. How many more than 80 million refugees can you wish for? Climate refugees. Yes. I mean, really, really, we are self-obliterating ourselves. I'm taking up a little lighter topic. And yes. that is about, you know, the kind of professional choices that you made throughout your entrepreneurial journey. Yeah. And you had played different roles in your life. You know, uh, uh, I believe you started your career as a theater artist also. I think you, right. you initiated, yeah, I somewhere I read it. Please correct That's me right. if I'm wrong. Yeah, no, it's and right. You took up some script writing work also for a couple of plays in theater. Then you wanted, because you always probably felt that you were being micromanaged with the kind of roles you were being offered during those days That's right <laughs> <laughs> so you took that charge in your hand of producing directing movies and you made some of the wonderful movies with the brilliant actors like om puri seriously wonderful wonderful work amazing work yeah om puri left us how could he leave us yeah i, <laughs> I love om puri I loved him. I love him. He's the most extraordinary human being. Very, very extraordinary. Huge heart. Anyway, yeah, he became a very, very good friend. Um, sorry, I've interrupted you. Go yeah, ahead. Absolutely. Go ahead, Ryan. Please carry on. Please carry on. Yeah. So, which role is most close to your heart? I know it is very difficult to choose between all five fingers. All five fingers are close to you, but which one is more close to your heart? There is no question what I'm doing now. You see, I have given up all the other four for good reason. I moved from one to the other because I wasn't satisfied. Um, when I started off acting, that's all I wanted to do. There was not a chance in hell that I would turn my attention or love or desires to any other profession. In fact, I was such a purist that I didn't even want to do television or cinema acting. For me, the real pure acting was, you know, I was <laughs> very young. <laughs> and um, that's how I saw it. The theater was the ultimate pure form of, of drama. And, and then I realized that actually, if I carried on that way, I wouldn't be able to pay my rent, you know. And I had to support myself because my father refused he did not want me to do this stupid profession, he said, you know, you go to law school uh, and I will pay for your education. You need to become a lawyer. You've got that kind of brain. That's what you should be doing. He wasn't far wrong, I have to say in retrospect, but my passion was not for law. Right. So basically, I paid my own way through university. Um, then what happened was I realized, well, I'll never be able to survive unless I do television or film work because theatre work is so badly paid. Uh, so then I started compromising and doing the, uh, television and film. And then I started to get really dissatisfied with acting because I had a sort of real life um, experience in my, in, in, in my um, home uh, of being threatened 
if, with my safety threatened, along with all the other people who lived in the house, because a very psychopathic criminal landlord mm. bought our house and tried to pull, push us out so that he could make enormous profits. It's a very long story, and I'm not going to go into it now. But that kind of jolted me to understand that as an actor, I didn't have control mm -hmm. over what stories were being told. Mm -hmm. And suddenly something very important happened that made me think, oh my God, people need to know about this story yeah. because it ended up quite optimistic. I had taken on a fight and I set a legal precedent in the high court and it was a two and a half year battle, but then I made a film about it. Yes. Because yes. I wanted other people to be inspired by it. And to know that if you stand up to bullies, you can win through, you know. So suddenly I found, oh, it's much better to be a producer. Because as a producer, I can actually control what is the story and the vision of how that is being told. As an actor, you're really the, the vehicle through which the story is being told. But you don't have the storyteller's, narrator's voice. Yes. You have you're part of that. Right. So then I became a producer. I made my very first film, Freed, Six Innocent Men from Prison. So then I became a producer and the first film I made, Who Bombed Birmingham, it was called, released Six Innocent Men from Prison mm -hmm. who had been wrongfully convicted by yeah. a miscarriage of justice, one of Britain's most shameful mm -hmm. miscarriages of justice, for 17 years, they were in prison for a crime they didn't commit. Mm -hmm. Then I became a director for the India's Daughter film as a one-off. Why? Because I needed to go there. The protests on the streets of India's cities so inspired me that I couldn't do what I normally do with my films, which is I go to a distributor or a studio and I say look here's my idea this is what I want to do will you fund and it takes a year to raise the funding I couldn't do that I needed to go now the protests were happening they were on the streets so I went and made it with my own money the BBC only got involved much later a year later actually yeah, okay quite cynically after I had gotten the interviews with uh -huh the rapists in Tihar. That's when the BBC signed the contract and said, okay, we'll give you 40% of the funding. Okay. But at first I was making it completely on my own coin from my savings and there wasn't time to do anything else. And therefore, you know, I had to pay certain people like the camera person, the sound person, but um, I had a partner at the time who was working as a co-producer and uh, we, we, neither of us obviously took any money uh, for, for ourselves, for salaries. Um, and I, um, I thought, well, I can't afford, we can't afford to hire a director, so we're gonna have to do it ourselves. Mm -hmm. And that's literally how it happened, um, that I became uh, a, a director, if you like. Mm -hmm. Um, and then having made this film, you know, and sitting in that editing room for a year and a half, replaying, replaying, you know, basically what a director does in the editing room is get to know every inch, every centimeter of the footage, because you're actually directing, you know, the film is directed in the editing room. I mean, anything that happens before that is just the recording, which is in a documentary, never perfect. You can never get, you just have to hire the right cameraman who knows how to get the shots and hopefully the shots are wide enough that you can zoom in and turn them into two shots because in places we were filming in, in you know, um, in, in the uh, semi-slum um, that, that most, well, two, four of them, uh, came from, uh, we were literally on the run. We, we didn't have, we had one camera. There was no way we could get more in there, you know, in RK Puram. Okay. Right? Yeah. Um, so, so we had to make do. The real work happens in the, in the edit. And in that edit, the insights are washing over me in a way that is just extraordinary and transforming me and making me think, oh my God, of course. Of course, he says that because. 
Leela Seth says this because no, she's she's right about that, but she's wrong about this. You know, she said education is is the key. Education is the only thing that can change things. Said the extraordinarily brilliant, amazing Leela Seth, um, who sadly also has left us. Um, anyway. Um, but then she said something that really was very meaningful to my understanding and insights because she said, education is what will change all this because education gives a girl a sense of self-worth and gives a boy an, an understanding and respect of a woman. And I thought, well, Leela, that would be a great thing, but does it? It doesn't actually, it doesn't. This is the problem, education should do this, but it doesn't. So all these tiny little bits and pieces, right? Pull together to make me understand what Mandela actually really encapsulated when he said, no child is born hating another human being. We have to teach our children to hate. And if we can teach them to hate, we can teach them to love. So that is when I thought, no more films, end of my film career, because how can I responsibly, knowing what I know, turn my mind to another subject now? Just look at in another direction. When I know so much, when I know how to solve this, I truly believe I know how to solve this. And I will stand up for that. I know, I know. I don't just think I know, I know I know. And not only do I know I know, we are now with 77,000 children impacting their lives in 14 countries, in six continents, and we've only been going for three and a half years with the program. You tell me how all the stories that are coming back from teachers, from parents, about violent children being turned around completely, mm. about racists, little racists at three coming to a Think Equal class and being flipped within three months, one month, four months. It's happening incredibly quickly. It is like magic and it's the easiest thing in the world. There is nothing difficult about it. It is utterly cheap. It's $2 per child is how much it works out to. Okay. Now, people listening to this podcast should really, uh, sorry, to this interview should really think about Yes. How much do they pay on how many coffees do they drink a week? Right. If they just gave up, okay, okay. right? But, you know, anything, any fundraising we do, any monies that come into us, we immediately apply to a program. That is all we do. I don't take a salary. Yes. I haven't taken a salary for five years. Mm -hmm. Okay? I didn't take a salary on the film. Mm -hmm. So I actually, I haven't taken a salary since 2013, seven years. I'm living on everything that's left, not much now, of East is East. That is literally what I've been living on. Why? Because if I paid myself a salary, mm -hmm. I wouldn't be able to do as much and reach as many children. True. So any money we get, and every $2, you know, if somebody just gives $2 a, a month, that's 12 children getting Think Equal who would not normally be getting these positive foundations for the rest of their lives. Yes. Yes. You know, and what they are learning is to respect, to love. They're learning to control their feelings. They're learning to identify their feelings. Apart from anything, a child needs to know the difference between anger and frustration. Indeed. And a child needs to know that when they feel anger, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with them. It's okay. We all feel anger. All yes. feelings are okay. Yeah. We all feel sadness. We all sometimes feel extreme sadness. Yes. But what we need to learn is how to deal with that. We need techniques and we give them several tools and several ways of dealing with that. We've partnered with Yale University Center for Emotional Intelligence. We use their ruler program, which is brilliant, best practice. Mm -hmm. We also use a meditation program that's been co-written with the Dalai Lama and, um, and Wisconsin Madison University, the amazing neuroscientist, Professor Richard Davidson. Um, that's eight weeks of the 30 weeks of yeah. level one. Yeah. 
eight, uh, eight weeks of the 30 weeks of level two is another meditation program called the C curriculum, also Dalai Lama involved, S-E-E. Again, a brilliant program. Now that program is from seven years onwards. Okay. If you look, we don't work with seven years. We only work up to and including the age of six. Yes. So the bottom line is, we also partner with amazing organizations that take the work forward. Because of course we want six year until adulthood to continue right. these good practices, etc. Yeah. But by yeah. laying the foundations, we are literally changing the mindset in a foundational way of those children so that they automatic pilot, their reflexive brains mm. are created in neuro pathways that are empathetic, compassionate, kind, they share. One of our lovely friends, um, Sakya Raghu, who has been a great supporter of our work, mm -hmm. um, he has two gorgeous children, Ira and Virad, I think their names are. Okay. And he sent us a message just to thank us because we gave him all of the materials. His son is, uh, is six and his daughter is three. And they have been working through the materials as a family. Mm -hmm. And he, he sent us this, this beautiful video, you know, in which he, he says, within a couple of weeks of starting the program, they were in a supermarket and his child, uh, uh, Virad, said to him, Daddy, we need to buy two of those. And there was some food he was buying. Mm -hmm. and, and the father said, why? He said, because the watchman's children also need that. Oh. And since then, he has become a little young philanthropist who takes care of ensuring that the watchman's children get what he gets yes. because he is now. And, and Satya said, they've never said that to their children. This isn't something they've assumed their children were too young to start thinking about that. Mm. These kids are automatically becoming advocates of others. Yes. They are becoming compassionate yes. and collaborative and kind they are saying to their parents yeah mommy you are blue please talk about it it's important to talk when you feel blue and red particularly you should talk about and the parents are coming to the teacher saying well what is this thing this thing with the colors we want it can we have one at home you know because it's a revolution for humanity yes it's teaching our children to love not to hate and it's so easy to do, and it's so cheap, and we should all be insisting on this. We should make damn sure that every school has this, that every child, it's their right. It's our children's right to not grow up and rape. Right. To not grow up and become depressed or commit suicide, you know? And people look at the Nirbhaya case and say, ah, she got justice because they were hanged. Remember what driver of that bus said to me when I interviewed him, when I said, now there will be less rapes in India. Because of this case, the Supreme Court, the courts have meted out hanging for rape. So now men will not rape because they will not want to lose their lives and be hanged. And he looked at me very simply and he said, now they'll just kill the girls after they rape them so that they can't recognize us. And let me tell you what I've seen again and again, day in, day out on my Google alerts, which still go, and I, for some bizarre reason, I can't bring myself to switch them off. It's like if I switch them off, I'm putting the film totally behind me and I can't do that yet. I'm not ready for it yet. But I see those Google alerts on a daily basis. Delhi rape, gang rape, anything to do with the film was the alert set seven years ago and I still get them right. I am seeing more and more raped and eyes gouged out, raped and choked, raped and hanged. Why? Why? We fool ourselves if we think that that is justice. The only justice Nirbhaya will ever get, and I'm not talking about her parents. 
I can understand they had this absolute overwhelming need to see those men hanged. I can understand where they're coming from. I think it's highly misguided. But I understand where they're coming from and I love them. She will only get justice when think equal is a compulsory subject in every single class in India. Full stop. Nothing else will do and nothing else will make the difference. And if anybody thinks it will, they are fooling themselves. And thank you so much for talking to us and thank you so That's much for sharing true. your perspective. So much. We truly appreciate it. The last thing I'd like to say is, ye mera subhagya hai. Ye hamara bhi subhagya hai. Thank you guys for watching.